are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. My next guest and I have something in common, which is that we are both fugitives from a highly profitable chain gang uh, known as the health insurance industry. Wendell Potter was a senior executive with Cigna before he... Uh, like me, uh, left. In Wendell's case, he did so in a public way in order to bring attention to the problems with the uh, for-profit healthcare industry in the United States. He has done so with great success in in the years since then. He has written several books on the topic. He's become a public spokesperson for a saner healthcare system in this country. Uh, Wendell Potter is currently the president of the Center for Health and democracy and he's recently helped lead a study on the profits of health insurance companies that i thought was uh, extremely important i haven't talked to him in some time on the program so it's good to have him back first of all wendell potter welcome back to the zero hour Roger, thanks so much good to be back well as i say good to have you and your piece which i found at wendell potter.substack.com uh healthcare uncovered uh headline big insurance 2022 of course because that's the year this just concluded revenues reach 1.25 trillion uh tell us about it if you would please yeah no one has done uh what we what we did which is to look at the uh, earnings reports for the seven big, large for-profit health insurance companies, uh, analyze those reports, figure out where the money's coming from, uh, and what they're doing with that money. And uh, it takes some time to do that because you have to go over these very dense documents uh, that the companies publish. They actually report their earnings every three months. This was uh, both for the fourth quarter and the full year 2022. And we just did a deep dive into that. But not only for 2022, but looking at how these companies have changed since 2012. So it's a really a, a, a 10-year perspective. And Richard, uh, uh, the companies you and I work for, despite our best efforts, are much bigger <laughs> and uh, much uh uh, bigger, richer, and more powerful than ever before. And they're involved in our uh, healthcare and our lives in ways that uh, they, they weren't before and picking our pockets in ways they haven't before. The, the, some of the figures you came up with, Wendell, are, are, are really, even for me as, as somewhat of a, a realist and therefore a cynic about this industry, staggering you, you compare, comparing revenues between 2012 and 2022 big insurance revenues these large companies you talk about uh, increased 300 percent profits have increased 287 percent in other words you know pretty much tripled in both cases and you say in your highlights section that this is due to explosive growth in both their pharmacy benefit management or PBM businesses and the Medicare replacement plans that are currently known as Medicare Advantage. So uh, let's let's focus on both of those in succession, if you would. Uh, let's talk first of all about pharmacy benefits management. What what exactly is that as an industry or as a subsector of an industry? It's become a very very big uh, part of. Uh, of these companies. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers have been around for some time. They were initially created uh, to help insurance companies and employers figure out an appropriate amount to pay drug companies for their products. And uh, uh, what has happened is that insurance companies have seen the potential for huge profits uh, as part of the pharmacy supply chain. So they've jumped in in a very big way. Cigna, a few years ago, back in 2018, bought uh, Express Scripts, which was one of the largest PBMs in the country. Uh, United Healthcare has Optum RX, and CVS, which owns Aetna now, also owns Caremark, which is the third big PBM. So between the three of them, they control 80% of this market, which is enormous. And we're talking about huge amounts of money. And we've seen over the course of the last several years, uh, a lot of attention focused on pharmaceutical companies uh, and not so much on this often misunderstood, if not completely unknown, 
part of our health insurance uh, system. And uh, uh, the, it's, it's why in so many cases, either the, the medications that our doctor prescribes for us is not on our so-called formulary, or if it is, it might cost us an arm and a leg when we go to the drugstore to pick it up. Uh, these companies supposedly negotiate deals with drug companies uh, and pass along savings to their customers. But uh, what we're finding is that's not the case at all. They're pocketing a big portion of what we pay uh, for pharmacy, for pharmaceuticals in this country. So, Wendell, I've heard uh, when we talk about the pharmacy benefit management, I've heard stories, for example, of people who go to the pharmacy and present their insurance card or pharmacy card and are charged more for medication than they would have been if they didn't present that card. In other words, there's actually a markup in the amount they pay out of pocket. And they may call it a copay or their share of the cost, but that they could actually buy the medication uh, cheaper than what their copay is It's in certain times, in certain circumstances, under PBMs. Is that true? It's absolutely true that I can, I can personally vouch for that. I've had the same experience myself. And I would suspect that uh, most people uh, would find the same thing. Uh, next time you go, if you have prescription medications and you pick it up at the drugstore, ask the pharmacist if, it's, if it could be cheaper to just pay out of pocket without even showing your insurance card. And in many cases, you'll find that you can actually uh, get a better deal by not uh, using your insurance card. Uh, and I think that is true not only for people who have Medicare Part D or a pharmacy benefit, but people who get their coverage through their employer or on their own. Um, it's, it's, it's insane that that is the case, but in many cases, it's the way these companies strike deals with drug companies. They will often, uh, uh, the drug companies will want to have their most expensive drugs on uh, a, an insurance company's formulary. So the deal that they strike puts that drug on the formulary. In some cases, less expensive drugs are not on the formulary. And when you go to the drugstore, you'll find that drug is there, that brand name drug, for an example. Uh, but you might be able to get uh, a better deal by not even showing your insurance card. That's because, again, these companies, these insurance companies through their PBMs are pocketing a great deal that they presumably are saving for us. And I had an experience, Wendell, when I was under an employer health insurance plan managed by Aetna, where I have a chronic condition, I have to receive a biologic in, uh, uh, medication every month, which as you know, those are quite expensive. I was receiving it for free at a clinic every month. And uh, Aetna, the insurer, a nurse called me and said, you can have this sent to your home. You can inject it yourself at your home. Uh, so they sent it to me and then sent me a bill for $400 a month. Um, and when I tried to say, well, I could, you know, why not I just go back to the it, it, long story short, after probably 12 hours on the phone, uh, the Aetna owned the pharmacy, this, which was CVS home pharmacy delivering this, these injections to me, they, they, they owned the insurance company. They owned the company that employed the nurses that kept calling me on the phone. So everybody I talked to in every aspect of my medical care had an interest in forcing me to spend $400 a month that I hadn't been spending before. It took months to straighten it out. And, um, and many, many hours. And because I know something about this business, I was eventually able to do it. But I would think that most people in that position are stuck, number one. And number two, isn't this exactly an example of the kind of thing you're talking about? It absolutely is. Yeah, most people I don't think would have any idea that they could do what you did or would have the time, if they, even if they had the knowledge uh, that they could do this and push back. But what we're seeing is these companies are self-dealing. Uh, Aetna in particular and CVS uh, gets, CVS gets more money from its PBM uh, Caremark than it does from the Aetna health plans, which is big, uh, and more than, than CVS takes in from its 10,000 retail stores. So that gives you an idea of just how much money we're talking about here. It's huge. And it has enabled uh, CVS to become the fourth largest 
company in the country on the Forbes uh, 500 list of American companies. And United Healthcare is right behind it at number five. Uh, so these companies are making huge amounts of money, both revenues and profits. Uh, and uh, uh, what they've done and what you were explaining is how they have uh, done something that's referred to as vertical integration. It's not that they are just buying competitors in health insurance, but they're buying other parts of health care. United Healthcare is now the, the largest employer of doctors in this country. Uh, and CVS, of course, and, and other big insurers now have clinics. They have mail order pharmacy operations. And uh, so they are capturing even more money than, than would be even evident from my analysis because of the way they're taking in money on the, on the one side of the house, premiums from people who have health insurance with, 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 uh, with Aetna or whatever the company might be. On the other side are these PBMs and these units that employ doctors and own uh, facilities like clinics and dialysis centers. So it's just incredible how these companies have changed and the various ways they're uh, sticking their hands in our pockets and taking money that they're not they should they're not really entitled to. And when you think about something, for example, like pharmacy benefits being such a driver of profits, it's been a while since I knew the uh, healthcare cost numbers inside and out, but uh, pharmaceutical benefits were never the majority of cost. So that suggests to me that there's a lot more profit taking going on in, in certain, you know, subsectors of the economy, health economy, and that, 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 for example, and we can talk about some of the others, but for example, that pharmacy benefits, medications is one where it's just being uh ripe for uh overcharging bilking there's just too much money going around that's not paying for people's medications is that a fair interpretation of what i'm hearing oh you're absolutely right you know we 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 have focused a lot uh, over the past few years on the uh the, the 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 amount of money that pharmaceutical companies are charging for their drugs and and in many cases it's not justified by any means uh but what we're seeing is that uh Pharmaceutical prices, as a part of total spending on healthcare in this country, comprises about 10% of our overall spending. You know, that's a significant amount of money when you're considering that we spend $4.5 trillion, but still, in overall spending, it's still just about 10%. So when you're getting this kind of money from the, the pharmacy supply chain, and these companies, these big companies like Aetna and Cigna and United are capturing so much, uh, that just shows you how much is is uh, available to them, uh, even in a relatively small part of the healthcare spending in this country. Uh, they uh, the other point that's uh, uh, kind of relevant to this is that uh, insurance companies are not able really to control the unit cost of pharmaceutical uh, cost or stay in the hospital, so they focus instead on how they can. Uh, erect barriers to make it more expensive or more difficult for us to get the care that we need. And that's what they've done. Right. It's a, a which is when you think about it, I mean, I'm curious to know your thoughts, but I, I've often felt this is the exact opposite of what a social contract is supposed to do. In other words, Medicare is a social contract. Medicaid is a social contract. Some of us would argue that all Healthcare should be a social contract that people should get health care when they need it. That's the mission. But it seems to me the profit incentive is the diametric opposite of that, isn't it? It's to withhold care. That's where the money is made in the withholding of care. Am I oversimplifying? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, as, as you know, there, and this is somewhat of a simplification, but there are two main ways of managing uh, health care costs. Uh, and in the insurance business, they call it medical cost management or medical management. And the two ways are to influence or control or manage the unit cost of goods and services, like uh, the unit price of a particular medication or a stay in the hospital, or uh, affecting the utilization of those services, those goods and services. And that's what these companies focus on. They make us pay more and more out of our own pockets 
uh, which discourages people from getting the care that they need. In many cases, uh, uh, they will uh, exclude certain medications from their formularies because of the deals they've cut. So you're exactly right. Uh, they've figured out many different ways to make it more difficult for us to get the care that we need at a price that we can afford, even with insurance. So as premiums go up every year, uh, so do our out-of-pockets. And so does a lot of the, uh, the work that they're doing that uh, in a social contract should facilitate access to care, but instead there are barriers to care. Wendell, one of the things your study sort of highlighted for me and your, uh, your last comment uh, also brought to mind is that I think a lot of times our national conversation about health care is uh, slightly misguided when economists or others talk about the total top line costs of healthcare to our society, for example, is GDP or whatever, it's extremely high compared to any other industrialized country. But even so, I think we sometimes understate the cost to regular working people because uh, they may say, well, infl healthcare inflation for this year was a modest, quote unquote, whatever it was, without considering that uh, first of all, it's on a very high base of cost, but secondly, the total cost may have only increased by only by five, six percent, but it may be that because of the profit models of the insurance companies, the out-of-pocket costs for individuals may have gone up 10 percent. And it seems to me that's a part when you talk uh, in your comments and in your writing about bilking uh, the public or taking money out of people's pockets, to me it's not just about the profit taking, but it's about where the profit is coming from, and it's it's coming from you and me and everybody we know, isn't it really? It is. It's coming from us as customers of these companies, uh, whether you're a customer of CV a CVS drugstore or retail store or uh, an Aetna health plan or a Caremark PBM. Uh, but your point is, is absolutely correct. And we need to uh, focus on how much it's costing individuals and individual families. And out-of-pockets in particular have been going uh, up very, very rapidly. And it's something that that Sadly and regrettably, I was a part in pushing onto the American public when I was still working at Cigna. One of the things that I did, along with my peers in the industry, was to persuade policymakers and employers and the rest of us that it was our fault that health care costs were going up, uh, that we were utilizing health care too much. And that's why. Uh, the industry rolled out this big campaign focused on a talking point that Americans needed to have more skin in the game. And now we're seeing the consequences of that. We're seeing that we are having to pay far, far more out of our own pockets before our insurance will kick in. Uh, that gives uh, that that gets insurance companies off the hook from paying uh, billions of dollars in claims that we now have to pay. And those out of pockets have been going up steadily. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, when it was passed, set an upper limit on out-of-pockets, uh, but it's been going up. It goes up every year under the way that law was structured, and the insurance industry was very savvy uh, to persuade Congress to go along with the way they, they structured this. Today, a, a family can be on the hook for $18,200 out of their own pockets before their insurance coverage will kick in. And that's far more than most average household can afford. Um, a lot of, if not most, uh, uh, household have less than a thousand dollars in savings, regrettably. So you, you you can see what happens when someone is facing that much money out of pocket. In fact, uh, uh, Zeke Emanuel, who played a a big role in uh, putting together the Affordable Care Act when he was working with the Obama administration, Dr. Zeke Emanuel, he's on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, uh, said that Congress and the uh, Obama administration uh, made a huge mistake by the way they handled the uh, out-of-pocket limit in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and people are, again, walking away from the pharmacy counter because they have to pay so much out of pocket these days. You know, and this is so important because, uh, you know, I, I think I caused a little bit of a stir at a conference in Maryland when 
a speaker said, uh, you know, 30% of the people with insurance in Maryland, uh, with private insurance in Maryland are underinsured. And I said, I would argue that 100% of the people with private insurance in Maryland and elsewhere are underinsured because that now they may have the cash to make up the difference or they may not depending on but you pointed out <clears throat> you know we've seen these surveys about people saying they wouldn't be able to put their hand you know more than half of people saying they wouldn't be able to put their hands on four hundred dollars easily if an emergency came up and yet most of their health plans have a thousand dollar deductible i mean this is to me this isn't rocket science to me this is a system that's designed to fail to meet the needs of people in a healthcare emergency. And I think to me, this is one of the soapboxes we ought to be on. And I think your study emphasizes one of the reasons why that is, because it's not, you know, there was a case of the teacher in Texas, the young woman who had a, a flu and didn't want to spend the $120. It was stretching her budget for an antibiotic and died. Well, that should never happen. but I would argue that's a feature, not a bug of the current system, not the death of an innocent person, but the idea that they don't want you to buy the medication because getting back to your earlier point, the profit, uh, the business model is in the denial of care, right? So, I mean, I don't understand, provided you agree with that, why more people aren't up in arms about this. They should be, and certainly our our politicians should be up in arms. So I think, frankly, that they're just not well informed, and that's why I do what I do with this newsletter and with that analysis. I've, as you know, spent quite a bit of time on Capitol Hill, and I've just been uh, dismayed by the lack of understanding by members of Congress and staff. A lot of the staff were, you know, they were in high school when the Affordable Care Act was passed back in in 2010. Uh, so there's just not very much of an understanding. And uh, one of the things you said a few minutes ago is is important to kind of to to repeat year after year. Uh, these increases, these changes are incremental. And in many cases, we don't pay a lot of attention to them. That's by design. But when you look again at 10 years of time, uh, you'll see just how dramatic these changes have been. Uh, uh, and now a family policy we're talking about premiums here, not out of pocket. It's just premiums for a family policy is now over $22,000 a year. Um, and uh, employers pick up a big chunk of that if you get employer sponsored coverage. But increasingly, workers are having to pay a higher percentage of that as well. So those are going up. Out of pockets are going up. And people are not getting the care and the medications they need because they just simply can't afford it. It is a feature. It's not a bug. It was absolutely deliberate on the part of the insurance industry uh, to create this the way it is. And now we're, we're seeing the consequences. Uh, 100 million Americans now have medical debt. Most of those people by far have health insurance. But to your point, they're underinsured. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund has found that 44% of the people who get their coverage through the Obamacare exchanges are underinsured. Another term for that is that they're functionally uninsured. They're paying premiums, and in many cases, taxpayers are subsidizing those premiums. And that's a, a way of saying that even with what my analysis showed, it actually undercounts the amount of money that they're getting from taxpayers because uh, for people who get their coverage through the those ACA exchanges or Obamacare exchanges, most of those folks cannot afford to pay the premiums on their own. So the federal government is subsidizing those. And that money is going straight to these insurance companies. So they're making money hand over fist from the pharmacy supply chain now, which is a big change from when I was in the industry, and also from public programs. Uh, which is another big part of what I found in my analysis. And that's exactly what I wanted to get to next, which is, and, and you've just raised another dim uh, dimension of this whole issue, Wendell Potter, which is uh, the transfer of wealth, not only from individual enrollees, patients to whatever, but from the public uh, in terms of what are in effect government subsidies to uh, to these private uh, immensely uh, profitable companies, right? Uh, 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 you know, and 
uh, I want to get to Medicare Advantage. If we have time, I want to talk a little bit, for example, about insulin. But for example, a program that reduces that limits the out-of-pocket cost for uh, insulin to thirty-five dollars a month, with the government picking up the rest, obviously is better than letting diabetics patients die. Is uh, important. But people should also understand that's a wealth transfer program from the public as well. If you don't do something about the the cost of the medication in total, you're just shifting the cost from an individual to the whole uh, American people. But uh, before we get to that, you, know, you also pointed out in your, your study that um, med so-called Medicare Advantage, which I am among those who say it's neither Medicare nor Advantage, but uh, Medicare Advantage, the programs that uh, uh, people in Medicare can enroll in as an alternative to traditional Medicare, run primarily, not exclusively, but primarily by for-profit corporations. I think there are nonprofits in there too, but but uh, these private programs uh, are also a huge uh, source of the new wealth for uh, the health insurance industry, aren't they? They really are. Uh, and yes, there are some nonprofits, uh, notably Kaiser Permanente in California and a few other nonprofits. Some of the, the Blue Cross plans remain nonprofit, but many of those have converted to for-profit status as well and are owned by a big company that's now called Elevance, used to be called uh, Anthem, and prior to that, WellPoint. Uh, uh, that company rebrands itself uh, every few weeks, it seems. But um, the for-profits have captured this market largely. Uh, United Healthcare and Humana are by far the biggest players in Medicare Advantage, but the other, other for-profits uh, uh, have a big market share as well, too. Uh, some of them are almost exclusively in the public space. And Humana, it's become so profitable that Humana, a few days ago, said it was pulling out of the employer space. In other words, it's going to stop selling coverage to employers and individuals. Uh, or at least employers, because uh, uh, they can make a lot more money on uh, on Medicare Advantage. And Kaiser Family Foundation just uh, came out with a, a report a few days ago that showed that the, the profit margins on Medicare Advantage are far higher than they are in uh, on commercial health insurance plans. In the, you know the, the plans that people buy in the uh, in the private market. Uh, so this is where uh, this is how taxpayers are being fleeced. These companies, the way they're making all this money is by rigging the system. And, uh, uh, you know, years ago, they were able to influence the government and how uh, they are, are reimbursed for participating in this Medicare program. And you're exactly right. This is not Medicare. It is these are private replacement plans for Medicare. And uh uh, these companies are getting, this has become the industry's biggest cash cow in addition to their PBMs. It, in my view, Richard, is the biggest transfer of wealth uh, from regular folks to big corporations and their shareholders in American history. It is a fleecing of American taxpayers like no one has ever seen before. And Wendell, you know, it seems to me, and maybe this comes from having worked for Bernie Sanders or whatever, wanting to put things in a simple way. But but it seems to me, if they can make all that money, then we're paying them too much. It, 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 it seems to me like there's an a complicated kind of dimension to it, which is they should not be making so much money from a public program. And if the formulas that are used to reimburse them in the system that is used to set all that up is causing this flood of cash to come into these private corporations for a public program, I feel there's just a fundamental design flaw. Am I being overly simplistic? No, you're not. Uh, it's, it's a design flaw that was uh, uh, came as a result of lobbying uh, by these companies, big lobbyists, and how they were able to influence lawmakers some years ago. Uh, the Medicare Advantage program, as we know it, came into being uh, in 2003 with the passage of the Medicare Modernization Act of that year uh, during the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, which Republicans controlled Congress. And what we're seeing now is a fulfillment of their determination to privatize the Medicare program. It's not just that either. It's the Medicaid program, which is operated, you know, funded by 
uh, the federal government largely, but also by the states and administer at the state level, um, big private insurance companies and mostly the for profits manage the Medicare benefit, Medicaid uh, programs for most states these days. So they're not only getting money from uh, the Medicare program, but the Medicaid program. Enormous percentages of what taxpayers pay uh, uh, in taxes and certainly for Medicare. Uh, goes into these big companies now in one way or another in the way that they have been able to take over uh, and privatize both Medicare and Medicaid increasingly. And before, you know, before we leave the subject of Medicare Advantage, I, mean, I think there are two things that need to be addressed. One is, you know, from spending time on the Hill, it's been an uphill battle to educate uh, members of Congress, for example, and their staff, because what they hear is that it's popular. And in fact, membership in these plans has grown because this government subsidy that you described, this this wealth transfer to corporations allows them to give giveaways to people, inducements to come into the program. They used to give cash back on the Medicare premium. They don't do that as much anymore, I think, but a little bit, but not, not often. But they do other inducements, health clubs or what have you, or you don't pay a premium. Uh, so people are happy with that. But uh, what happens is, you know, they try to cherry pick the healthier ones, too. I, I, you know, I imagine, uh, sadly, and I'm ashamed to admit it, I used to be good at figuring out how to do that. But um, it seems to me that then when what we find out is that when people get sick, which is what insurance is, all of a sudden they don't have the advantages of Medicare. My brother who had a terrible bout with cancer last year. We got him to Sloan Kettering. We got him to the places he needed to be. We couldn't have done that if he was in Medicare Advantage. Um, you, know, you can't get the doctors. You can't get the care. You can't get the medication. But people don't know that in those early days before they need care. So it seems to me that there's a huge customer bait and switch going on. That and it seems to me, but you know, of course, I want your thought. That the end game is, you know, you get most of Medicare, all of Medicare into these plans, and then they can really lower the boom. And it seems to me it's an attack on Medicare itself. But uh, again, am I being melodramatic? Unfair? No, you're not. In fact, we should be a lot more alarmed than we than we are, because as uh, uh, the Medicare, as a percentage of Medicare beneficiaries uh, increases, people that are enrolled in these private plans. Uh, uh, these companies will become even more emboldened. We will start seeing them uh, reduce their provider network works, uh, ramp up their prior authorization requirements. We'll have no alternative because they will become even bigger and more powerful. Doctors and hospitals need to understand this. They've been sort of on the sidelines and in some ways benefiting from the growth of Medicare Advantage. But that is going to change in the years to come as these big companies get more and more control of the Medicare program, they will be in the driver's seat. They'll be able to, uh, even more than they're doing now, uh, select what providers they want in network and exclude others, including many centers of excellence for cancer care, for heart care. They're not in many of these big companies' networks. Uh, prior authorization is becoming increasingly uh, uh, significant in these uh, these plans. The, when they when they advertise these plans, they always talk about the perceived benefits, uh, gym memberships, as you noted, but also dental and hearing and vision benefits. Usually, they come with very high out of pocket obligations, so it's it's not much of a benefit at all. But people don't know that, nor do they know that the networks of doctors and hospitals is particularly uh, uh, inadequate. Uh, as you get older, when you, my mother was 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 one of the victims. She broke her hip. We found out that the provider network for skilled nursing and rehab care, uh, the the network was very inadequate. So I was able to disenroll my mother from from the Medicare Advantage program. That's not necessarily easy or affordable for a lot of folks. Right, absolutely. So, uh, Wendell, I, you know, I know I've kept you. Long time, we had technical problems, and I'm sensitive to your time. But and this is a broad question, but just in general, what's the solution? I mean, you know, obviously for me, Medicare for all is an answer. Enhanced Medicare for all, as they call it, so that it does cover vision and dental, which are, you know, we're one organism. That's my philosophy. But you know, what do you see, kind of intermediate and longer term? What should we all be rowing toward? 
I think you I think you, you you hit on it. One is improving the the traditional Medicare program. When we talk about when a lot of folks talk about Medicare for all, it's important to say improved Medicare for all because the traditional program should have a dental benefit and a vision benefit and a hearing benefit. Uh, it doesn't. So that's one thing. Another is uh, Congress should pass the bill that has been introduced by uh, Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin and Ro Khanna of California that would prohibit these companies from even using the word Medicare in their marketing materials for these plans. Another is to rein in uh, the way they're making, uh, uh, the way they're profiteering. Uh, and, and there are some technical things that can be done, but in many cases, Congress will have to act to uh, uh, to trim these companies' uh, profits. It's really important because not only is it important for individuals, but for the country as a whole, more and more of our money that we're paying uh, as people with private insurance or as taxpayers going straight into these companies and they're getting more and more uh, in control of our lives. And needless to say, they should also be obligated to tell the public how they're doing, to, you know, they're like black box recorders we never get to listen to. Do, do people die? Do people lack the treatment they need, right? So mm -hmm. uh, on that, uh, and of course, there's so much more we could discuss, but this is an excellent report, which I encourage people to find on Big Insurance 2022 at wendellpotter.substack.com. My guest has been Wendell Potter, president of, uh, is the Center for Health and Democracy. Did I get that right? You got it right. Uh, I thank you for this great work, Wendell, and thank you for coming on the program. Richard, thanks. Thanks very much. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.